Thanks for listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos and the PCC Multiverse. Check out more great podcasts today on one of these awesome affiliate networks. You're listening to a Weeby Geeks Network podcast. You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. The Tangibound Network. Check it out. Tangiboundnetwork.com. Listen to this show, the latest episode, every time. A proud member of the Gunna Geek Network. The opinions expressed are those of each individual. Check out all the other geeky podcasts over at GunnaGeekNetwork.com and get ready because geekiness begins in 3, 2, 1. On this week's episode, it's a big win for Aquaman. But should we start saying DC's on the right track? The best and worst in TV for 2018. And what do we think about the return of Hellboy and MIB? Merry Christmas! As we once again delve into the pop culture cosmos. Welcome to the pop culture cosmos. And we're back with another episode of the Pop Culture Cosmos. My name is Gerald Glassford from Pop Culture Cosmos and Game Source. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our programs. But it wouldn't be a Pop Culture Cosmos without the Merry Elf himself. He's the man in charge at Humanica Media. You got to check out everything today at HumanicaMedia.com, Humanica Media on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and so much more. It is my good friend. It is Josh Peterson. All I can say to you right now, because I'm trying to get through this with my head cold, is Merry Christmas, my friend. During the holidays, we're actually Elf Mannequin Media. It's all right. Common mistake. But uh, yeah. And hey, I'm glad you're on here, man. Toughing it out. You need to get some rest, dude. Just uh, what's that thing they say? You put your, your blanket over your head and breathe in hot stuff. What is that? medicinal uh herbs you, you something breathe in over a yeah some type of medicinal herbs and in the state of nevada you can buy a lot of those medicinal herbs now oh, but yeah. i will say i just had a bowl of hot ramen kind of did the trick for about five minutes but it's now in the past and we'll just have to go from there and gut it out there is no time to rest because pop culture is still going strong and we're going to talk about it here in a minute but a little bit of house cleaning before we do i want to say first off To Josh and everyone out there, I wanted to mention that Valley Heart, we talked a little about the band in the previous episode, but I wanted to say again and reiterate exactly how good their music is, if you really enjoy it, because yes, they do have a lot of controversial lyrics that a lot of people like Josh and I get into as far as it's concerned, as far as the meaning and the depth of it, and really makes you think. So if you're like that and you want to go ahead and listen to some good hard edge rock music, Go ahead and listen to Valley Heart. They're available now on YouTube, Spotify, Pandora, Play Music, Deezer, iHeartRadio, Apple Music, and a lot more. So give them a listen to today. We truly appreciate it if you would. And I'm sure the guys at Valley Heart would too. And then last, uh, as far as the house cleaning goes, I want to mention that the My Charge battery pack for the Nintendo Switch review is now up and online at popculturecosmos.com and popculturecosmos.wordpress.com. In my review that I gave real quickly on our last episode, I mentioned it was started around three hours extra of battery power for the Nintendo Switch. It's actually, depending on how long you charge the actual My Charge itself beforehand, because it has a handy USB cable to hook up to, whether it's the docking station or laptop or computer or whatever you've got as far as the USB connection is concerned, you could get anywhere from, it says up to 10 when you go ahead and check it out on their Amazon page. But I got more of like three to nine, depending on the different types of charges. And for me, that was just awesome because I've used it, other stuff that like that as far as extra batteries for other devices, and they've gotten me nowhere near that. So I was very happy with three to nine extra hours, depending on the level of charge that I was going ahead and doing it. So I wanted to make sure and clarify that out there. If you want to take a look at a good deal for an extended battery to extend your playtime on the Nintendo Switch, check it out today. My Charge for the Nintendo Switch that's available now on Amazon. And you can check out my full review on popculturecosmos.com. It is going to be a great episode we have here today for you. We've got a lot to talk about when it comes to the box office because Aquaman and a lot of other movies debuted just truly in the middle 
of that awesome, awesome seven-day period for the movies that's out there. We're also going to get thoughts from the ladies from the Wine, Women, and Words, Michelle Levis and Diana Tierney. They're going to share their thoughts on the top five for them in 2018. And also, speaking of the top and bottom of 2018, Jessica Boggs from the TVRatingsGuide.com. She's also stopping by with the best and worst that both she and I are going to share as far as television in 2018. We're also going to be talking about MIB International, Hellboy. We're going to be talking about that a little bit later on. And Josh, in the middle of the program, is also going to share his thoughts on some great music that he also wrote about on PopCultureCosmos.com. So my friend, you and I both saw Aquaman this weekend. First off, I want to tell everybody it did about $72 million domestically here at the box office, which is very strong. No, it isn't quite as big of the openings as, let's say, like the Batman versus Superman and a couple of the others that have come in the DC universe. But from all appearances, Warner Brothers and DC is very happy with the success so far of Aquaman. It's been a big hit overseas, and it is now nearing $500 million worldwide. And that's pretty good for something that's only been out, depending on where you're at, as little as one week to three weeks. So I ask you, Josh, your thoughts on Aquaman. Is it worth all the hype? Is it worth all the fact that it's number one in the box office? And is it worth being a potential big hit and that's going to rectify a lot of things in the DC universe? Yes and no. Aquaman is a, it's just it's a fun movie, you know, the same way you we saw like Guardians of the Galaxy 1. That was a fun movie, right? Is a, a property that, you know, we we always knew about Aquaman. We knew, you know, people who liked the Justice League and, you know, he has that famous comic book arc where he almost killed the Justice League by getting them involved in the affairs of the Atlanteans. But no, it's a it's a fun movie. Jason Momoa plays the part really well. It, it's one of those things you don't really have to think about it. You can just kind of watch it and be it's it's a visual feast. There's a lot of like just the coloring is cool, the acting's well done. You know, there's not a lot of plot holes. There's some plot holes, but there's not a lot. But like my big thing coming out of it was that okay, well, if there's no more Batman and there's no more Superman, at least in the DC universe right now, and if talk of rebooting the the DC universe is true, then why are they making Aquaman? And what is what if it's successful? Are they just going to to retcon this? And what about Wonder Woman? Like, it, it all needs to tie into something bigger if it's going to, you know, if they're going to keep making these movies, if that makes sense. They didn't really go into much as far as extending the DC universe, because I think that's the overall state of Warner Brothers. It's in that kind of flux where they see the good things that they have in Aquaman and Wonder Woman, and they're going to continue those parts of it, but they really don't have a real grasp or an idea of what's going in the overall picture, especially with Henry Cavill and Ben Affleck most likely being out of the picture, although Jason Momoa says otherwise. But I'm going to have to say for now, it looks like they probably are out of the picture. And, and you know, it just, I was talking to my family, and it accentuates the fact that. There was nothing trying to that that actually built up the extended part of the universe, and it was just very self-contained. Otherwise, which in a, in the case of a lot of people, they seem to like the fact that it was self-contained. It wasn't serving a higher purpose. I kind of like those tie-ins at some point in time to other parts of the DC universe. The Justice League was not a great movie. Okay, I get that. In fact, a lot of people thought it was a bad movie. I thought it was all right. It's it was all right. It is what it is. But I like the part where at the end of Justice League, spoilers again, the part where they were talking about assembling a league of villains. And I think there was a golden opportunity to go ahead and accentuate that and and really build that up as far as at some point in time in the film. And they really didn't do that. They focused on what they could work on because there's so much out there within the DC universe that they're not sure of. So they, I guess it's, I guess in actuality, it is a smart move. They know what they have right now in Aquaman. They know what they have in Wonder Woman. And they just go ahead and will do self-contained stories until they can realize exactly what's going on and finalize what's going on in the DC universe. So I guess in, in the mindset, that's great. But as far as the picture is concerned, let's get back to that. Aquaman, to me, like you said, it's a lot of fun. CGI everywhere, battles galore, nonstop stuff going on. 
It doesn't stop to, to really make you think. It doesn't go in depth, but it doesn't go into a dark place that other parts of the DC universe has done. And I think that's a brilliant move by James Wan and Warner Brothers to not go heavy into the dark territory. They went for something light. And I think in that sense, it's really paid off. It's just a fun popcorn flick. Like I said, it doesn't get too heavy in depth. It doesn't get too dark. It just does the right amount of what it needs to do in continuing the Aquaman part of it. No, it doesn't do much for extending the DC universe. And for those like you and I who like to see that bigger picture, it doesn't do that much of it. But I'll tell you what, within a self-contained Aquaman world, it does a lot. And of course, it sets itself up for maybe some stuff in the future for an Aquaman 2 or even more. Who Perhaps, who knows? But I will tell you, $500 million worldwide in, what, two to three weeks right now of release. It's done a great job so far. And I see it becoming a bigger part of the DC universe going forward. Don't you? Yeah, if anything, like Aquaman has leadership qualities. And there are a lot of good comic book arcs that feature him and other members of the Justice League, not all necessarily together. So there's a lot of places they can go if they want to rebuild back into something that could resemble an, an extended universe. The movie was fun. Like the fights were huge and there was still they were fun to watch. You know, it wasn't like super violent. They're epic, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. So let me ask you this. Can we now start saying with the success of Wonder Woman last year, and the success of Aquaman seemingly, unless it totally falls off the rails, which I don't think it will. Do you see the DC Universe finally, and I mean finally, on a consistently right track? Because, yes, Justice League was in between them, and that was a misstep, no doubt about it. But from this point forward, can we have more faith and confidence in Warner Brothers and the DC Universe going along a little bit more smoothly and heading in a good direction? <laughs> let's not jump the gun here but uh you know i think they're they're taking a step in the right direction and that's that's what really matters because aquaman is doing very well with audiences people love the character people love jason momoa and if they're somehow able to figure out what worked in this movie and apply it to their other films i think they they could possibly have something good moving forward I hope so. I hope so. You and I have been talking about it at nauseum as far as the DC Universe. I know Rob McCallum and I always bring up the DC Universe and Warner Brothers missteps on almost every Cosmic Crossfire full edition that we do. So it would be awesome if we could actually see a light at the end of the tunnel for the DC Movie Universe. And I think for a lot of people, that would be awesome as well. What are your thoughts out there on Aquaman? Did you enjoy it? Did you not like it at all? Or do you have any plans to go see it? And do you like the fact that it was more self-contained and not a bigger part of the DC movie universe? Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Also as well, popculturecosmos, Humanica Media, and Game Source on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Coming up next, we've got the ladies from the Wine, Women, and Words Diana Tierney and Michelle Davis. They're going to go ahead and share us their thoughts on the top five of 2018. Josh will be coming up right after that with his thoughts on the music scene for 2018. And then we're going to go ahead with Jessica Boggs from the TV Ratings Guide. She's going to share her best and worst, and so will I, on TV in 2018. And then right after that, we're going to close out the show talking Hellboy and MIB. This is the Pop Culture Cosmos. Looking for an edge the next time you take on your favorite video game? Then check out Vitabrace High Performance Gamer Wristbands. Packed with the power of fruit seed oil, Vitabrace is clinically proven to help improve performance, giving you a better gaming experience. Head to MiracleFruitOil.com and use the promo code MEDIA10 to get $10 off your Vitabrace purchase. Whether you're looking to beat the time on your latest speedrun, or are fighting your way to the top on your favorite multiplayer or battle royale, Vitabrace can help you reach your gaming goals. Buy Vitabrace today at MiracleFruitOil.com. That's MiracleFruitOil.com. Vitabrace. Win with it. I'm asking podcasters from all around the realm about the top five things that mean most as far as 2018 is concerned. 
I got Michelle Lavis and Diana Tierney of Wine, Women, and Words, the podcast, which you got to check out today. If you are a book aficionado, it is a must. It is available on Libsyn, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and over uh, just a gazillion different podcast outlets. I got to ask you this, and I know the book world is very, very important to you ladies, so I'm going to start with you, Diana, your thoughts on your top five superstar things that you liked so far in 2018. I am totally here for the diversity that we're seeing in books now, and that's getting translated to movies that are being optioned. The first one that comes to mind is Crazy Rich Asians. I think that was like the highest grossing rom-com in I don't know how many years, and one of the top grossing in the this year. It has scored extremely well, like you said, all over the place, and it definitely has sparked interest not only in Crazy Rich Asians, the book, but mm -hmm. sequels. It's already starting production on that. They've already signed the director of Crazy Rich Asians to do mm -hmm. the sequel. So yeah, it's definitely become successful all around the and, world outside of China. And the producers, interesting fact, the producers of Crazy Rich Asians are also the same producers for The Hunger Games. They're from the same people. And then if you're interested in that diversity aspect, there's a lot more stories coming out of Cuba and dealing with Cuban culture. Veins of the ocean, though it wasn't didn't come out this year, I could think it came out either 2016 or 2017. That was a great book. Chanel Clayton came out in February with a book called Next Year in Havana. And then she's going to be coming out with another one, I believe, called When We Left Havana, dealing with Cuban refugees and books like that. I'm just totally here for It's been big this year in 2018, seeing the diversity, and I absolutely love it. And Michelle, what are your top picks for 2018? Like I said, it could be pop culture, it could be books, whatever you so choose. What are the biggest things that affected you in 2018? Definitely not new to the world, but this year has been the year of the audiobooks for me. Before this, I never really got into audiobooks. I couldn't really get behind them at all, but this year I started and it lets you experience books in a completely different aspect. I mean, we talked about it on the show um, on a few episodes, but you fully immerse yourself and you you read you experience the book the way the author intended you to experience it. But the books that really kind of stood out to me this year, City of Brass, we already mentioned that earlier. I am huge Emily Giffen fan. So she just came out with her new book this year, All We Ever Wanted, which was probably one of her best books yet. Um, it was very present. It, it dealt with a lot of social issues that are relevant today, not just for women, but for parents, dads, as a single dad and, and a married mother from a different family. And they have to deal with huge issues with their kids and and, and society. It's, it's a really great book. The Paris Secret by Karen Swan was like a historical fiction thriller mystery that we had on the show that we loved. Beautifully written and it had to do with art, World War II, which is, you know, anything with those two things is really a must read for me. But Diane is the historical fiction person. I am the thriller person. So two thrillers that I loved that came out this year, one of them was called Bring Me Back by B.A. Paris. And if anyone is on the bookstagram world on Instagram, that's the one with the yellow brick wall that, that, that was all over the place when it first came out. But people will remember it if, if they're part of the books, bookstagram world. I was actually tweeting the author while I was reading it, trying to figure out the ending. And all of my theories were wrong, and it totally threw me for a loop. And the last one was Baby Teeth. And I'm probably going to pronounce her name wrong, but it's by Zoe Stage. It was highly disturbing. It was about a woman who became convinced that her seven-year-old daughter wanted to kill her because she wanted her out of the way so she and her daddy could live happily ever after. And listening to that on audiobook makes it even more disturbing because the voice that the narrator uses for the daughter like makes your skin crawl just listening to it. So those are my five. Oh, that's awesome. That's a great list from both of you. 
I can really empathize with what you're saying as far as audiobooks are concerned because me, it's an issue of time because I've got so many different things going on in my life. I can't always sit down and read a book. I have already actually gone through three audiobooks this year myself, so I, I can definitely empathize with what you're talking about as far as going the audiobook way. And, uh, hopefully, no book aficionados and book nerds will actually, you know, curse me for saying that. But if they do, just send them over to us. We are huge fans of audiobooks. We actually had Julia Whalen on the show in July, I think it was, and she's. I joke around with her that she's narrated all the audiobooks. She did Gone Girl, The Other Wife, which was also really big, and like, what was uh, Kristen Hanna's latest one, The Great Alone which oh, is another wow. great book that came out this year, which I highly recommend for people. Beautifully done. And she narrated that as well. And we at Wine Moon Awards are big proponents for audiobooks. I think they're great. Michelle, I know Michelle just talked about how much she loved them. And I love them too. I listen to them in my car, while I'm working, while I'm cooking. They're fantastic. And you can get so many great audiobooks through Audible uh, and several other sources. Even your library has great audiobooks too. I order books all the time through the library, not only for my family, but for myself. So it's definitely a great way to go ahead and get books. If you're looking for alternative means than going through Goodread or Amazon or Barnes and Noble or whatnot. So that's awesome. Those are some great ideas. But I got to ask you one question before we head on out. Why is Wine, Women and Words the podcast to go for anyone interested in the literary world? Well, we get into the author's heads. If you're interested in how the author does what they do, we we sit down, we talk with them, we get how they their writing process. Sometimes we get them drunk. That has happened a few times. And they will spill secrets that they're not supposed to spill yet about books. But yeah, if you want to hear an author's perspective on writing and literature, we're the place to go to. Michelle, anything to add on about your awesome show? We just like to have fun with it. I think we try not to take ourselves too seriously. And and it comes through, a, you know, a lot of authors, you can tell coming on the show, they have either never done a hangout before, you know how it works, or maybe it's their first podcast. And they, you know, they always ask like, oh, well, what am I supposed to do? What, you know, is, how does this work? And it's really, we just want to talk to, uh, talk about your book. That's all we want to do. We want to pick your brain and we want to know why you killed off the character that we love so much or um, <laughs> how you came up with this huge plot twist. So it's basically, if a person has read the book that we're talking about and they loved it as much as we did, we're probably going to ask the same types of questions that they would ask if mm -hmm. they had the opportunity to chat with the author. Ladies, just cannot thank you enough for taking the time to spend with us today. And just so great to have you a part of the pop culture cosmos. Rob McCallum Films is back with a vengeance. Power of Grayskull, the definitive history of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, which chronicles the ultimate 80s billion dollar franchise, Masters of the Universe. See exclusive interviews and hear untold stories from the people responsible for creating the world of Eternia, a place full of magic and science, and learn about the craft of creating action figures and animation. Power of Grayskull is just one of our many projects at Rob McCallum Films. And we're back with the Pop Culture Cosmos. This is Gerald Glassford coming right back at you here. If you need a listing of where we're being played at on the radio around the world, you just check out our site, Pop Culture Cosmos on Facebook. It's got a listing right there or our site, popculturecosmos.com. It also has many of the podcast options that we're on. Just found out the other day we're on Bullhorn, and I didn't even know it. So that's another one of the over 30 different podcast outlets that we're on as well. My friend, you've got an amazing experience known as Humanica Media. So share us the goods, my friend. What's going on with Humanica Media? New Topic Apocalypse is out, and there's uh, another episode going up tomorrow. It's our Christmas episode. Other than that, we're just we got some things going on behind the scenes, and keep following us on Facebook, and you'll know about them soon enough. Once again, that's Humanica Media at humanicamedia.com, and also check out Humanica Media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. My friend. Along with listening to Valley Heart and talking some great things about them, you also got the chance to go ahead and elaborate on your thoughts on the music scene for 2018. So 
along with everybody checking out your article on popculturecosmos.com. I want to hear your thoughts, man, on the music scene for 2018. I didn't buy as many albums this year as I usually do. So I, I have maybe like, I want to say 10 that I've I've purchased and I'm I'm really, really, really digging. Some of I didn't dig so much, but... You know, all I say, well, hold on. All I say is, you're lucky this isn't 30 years ago, man. When there was no Napster, when there was no downloading, when there was no Apple Music, when there was nothing like that. 12-inch records and full albums and cassettes and compact discs had just come out, my friend. So oh, Your Walkmans were like a briefcase? Pretty much, pretty much. Yeah, it was it was uh, quite interesting. I had the old Sanyo tape deck right there for you. Quality, quality sound, and it sounded like this. It's closer to the source, man. Dolby NR, Dolby NR. <laughs> All right, so here's the ones that that I, I purchased this year. I got a Treyu's in our wake. It's not the Atreyu that I grew up with, but it's pretty close, and they've been trying for a long time to get back to that sound. If you're a fan of Avenged Sevenfold and Under Oath, the last song in that album features the vocal talents of M. Shadows and Aaron Glipsy. Bears Den, uh, Camp, Casey. Uh, so Casey is an interesting one because Casey, it's a, po- I want to don't say post-hardcore, but they kind of sing about mental illness, and that's kind of like it's the only album I've ever purchased that's actually like made me get close to crying because it's it's just, it's, it's good, you know, it's, it's, it's intimate and it's vulnerable. Coheed and Cambria's new album was pretty good. They went back to the Amory Wars. I know we've talked about that before. You got Corey Wells. Def Havana put out a new album. I know they're, I don't know if they're as big here as they are in the UK, but it's kind of a departure from their last album. It's more poppy sounding. Foxing is a good one. I know I've talked to you about Foxing before. I got God of War on this list also, like the God of War soundtrack. Have you listened to it? I've heard bits and pieces of it, obviously from playing the game, and then also as well been able to stream it online a little bit. It's definitely epic. Oh, it's good, yeah. And it's no wonder like God of War went home with so many awards. Our friends over at Hope's Fall, their album is definitely in my top five for this year. They somehow managed to retain the sound that they've always had, but improve it and also kind of improve the genre that they've become famous for over the years that's saying a lot because it's it's kind of that type of music is in a renaissance right now and like to to be a band that's over you know 10 years old they're i want to say they're maybe 15 15 20 years old but like they're just to to be able to make a comeback like that like that's that's no small feat okay so new york memorials another one you should check out honestly you can you guys can click on this uh this article on, on our website but i got pine grove i know we're divided on them thrice has a new album out and i know people still they're, they're kind of another band that came around the same time as hopes fall valley heart so we talked about valley heart definitely go check out that album and then last on the list i got the young hearts and they just have an ep out that's five songs but you can pick it up for four dollars on itunes it's worth checking out if you like bands like story of the year and hawthorne heights but no, definitely, I recommend if you have some time, go check out my 2018 album list because it, I do give some thoughts on each of the albums and what I thought about them. They're kind of little little mini reviews, but check it out if you want to know more. I can go on about it, but I don't want to take up too much time. Way to send that out, my friend. I don't want to take up too much time. Well, I mean, no I, could talk about, I could talk about those albums for like an entire episode. So I just, we got, we got to talk about other things, right? So <laughs> exactly. That should be a topic apocalypse episode right there for you. Right, right. Exactly. There you go. There you go, my friend. All right. That is his list of 2018 of the music that has really moved him. If you've got thoughts on any of those albums that he's talked about and written about on popculturecosmos.com, or you have ideas yourself on what moved you in the music world in 2018, share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Also as well, Pop Culture Cosmos, Humanica Media, and Game Source on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Well, coming up next, we've got Jessica Box from the TVRatingsGuide.com. She's going to be talking about, and of course me as well, about the best and worst in TV in 2018. And then after that, real quick, Josh and I are going to close it out with our thoughts on MIB International and Hellboy. This is the Pop Culture Cosmos. Check out what's been going on with the Pop Culture Cosmos show and the PCC Multiverse. I see the potential for basically like another Netflix kind of paradigm shift where 
here comes this other major player. They have a ton of resources. Apple could change the way that entertainment is consumed. They say it's the only time this year that you'll have stars from each brand battling each other. And we know it's not going to be the case, but they like to say that and more power to them, I guess. Well, it's a big first step bringing all those superheroes together. There were definitely some parts of the movie that I that I really enjoyed. And then there were some parts that I thought just kind of fell short of expectation. Part of it has to be something to do with how it's being promoted. And this is a thing where audiences do not agree with critics. That's the Pop Culture Cosmo Show. And the PCC Multiverse. Every week on the Podcast Radio Network and Apple Podcasts. And over a dozen of your favorite streaming and podcasting options. Okay, we're back with the show, and it's Gerald coming right back at you here. You know what? We are continuing our series all month long of people's top five in whatever category that it takes in pop culture. We've had so many diverse opinions, great thoughts, great lists out there. But you know what? I cannot do a top of 2018 without a top five of television and also a bottom list as well. And who better to tell me about her thoughts on the TV world, the best of and the worst of, than our good friend. She is the outstanding writer of one of the outstanding writers on their staff of the TVRatingsGuide.com. You got to check out all the great things going on today at the TVRatingsGuide.com, including, including their entire listing of all their original shows that they go ahead and write out that are that they display out during the course of the, the year. And you got to check out all the great shows there. Plus, they do a Renew Cancel Index, which I know everybody goes towards to, to find out which shows are hot, which shows are not, and which shows are right along the cut line when it comes to cancellation, articles, reviews, and so much more. It is my good friend. Miss Jessica Boggs. Happy holidays to you, my friend. Happy holidays to you, too. Well, it's great to have you back on the show. I told you earlier this month you'd be coming back for another segment, and I'm just so happy to have you here talking about your picks, and I'll throw in some of mine as well, in regards to the best of television and the worst of television in 2018. So I'm in suspense. I've gotten no hints from you. I've gotten no word ahead of time on what your list is for the best in television in 2018. So I'm on pins and needles, Jess. You got to let me know, what are your picks for television in 2018? Well, these are in no particular order. Number one, I went with the Big Bang Theory for the wedding episode and this whole entire final season. It seems like they're going out on top ratings wise. And the storyline is going into like, a general closing therefore it's like it's good for streaming and it's also good for syndication and it's good for their pocketbooks as well because you know there are some struggling actors on the show okay maybe not they make quite a bit of money each and every episode but still it's a great show coming to a fantastic end right exactly you've already started off with a comedy that people seem to love and enjoy what's your next shot crazy (laughs) ex-girlfriend Wouldn't be a list without one of your favorite shows each and every year, something that you and I like to talk about time and time again, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend on The CW. I think like this season in particular, it's a really nice change of pace with every episode starting with like, I am ashamed or I'm on my own path. And it has nothing to do with like an ex-boyfriend or a boyfriend on any episode like in the past three seasons. Absolutely. It has taken a turn, definitely. I, I've noticed it myself. It's obviously something that it's taken a direction that I think a lot of fans seem to enjoy. It has its own niche of, of followers out there. And I'll tell you what, it's definitely a, a interesting pick at number four. So I want to hear your number three, Jess. Atlanta from FX. Excellent show. I cannot agree with you more on that. Atlanta is a truly a inspired piece of art by Donald Glover. He is one of the hottest actors in Hollywood. And there's a reason why, because there's so much talent and people get a taste of that talent on Atlanta. And I'll just see what FX is just so, uh, I guess I'm sure I, I would assume so grateful for having that show on its network. Yeah. It's literally one of the top rated shows, literally the top rated comedy on FX right now. Uh, nice, nice, nice indeed. So you've got already, you got your fifth, your fourth, and your third. 
I got to hear your number two choice for your pick for television in 2018. I put number two as like Super Bowl commercials, but my real number two would be The Good Place. Ah, The Good Place, a beloved favorite for many out there. Something that I know a lot of people really enjoy and and really take hold of when it comes to Thursday nights on NBC. Tell us a little bit why you enjoy The Good Place so much. It has a limited series type thing and some special effects. Whereas you see the main character going to heaven, even though she's done crazy things in her life. And you see queening of like cuss words in heaven, pretty much. Exactly. Uh, And obviously uh, the fork doesn't go without saying. So definitely a, a, a very solid choice at number two for you right there. There's a lot of great shows out there. And there's a lot of great things to see on television. So I got to hear it, Jess. What is your number one show on television for 2018? It's the two seasons of Unreal. One season, it's like you had, like it came out after like a, a year and a half off. But it's it's such an underrated gem that you see. It's like it's based on like the Bachelor type thing. And they're just basically making fun of that. Gotta love those satirical shows. I know there's... Quite a few of them out there, but it sounds like Unreal does it better than any of them. Oh, yeah. But there are also a lot of good shows that that parody other different types of shows. Like, you see SNL sketches parodying shows, but I've never seen an entire show parodying a reality show in its entirety from, like, the production standpoint. That's a great pick right there for you. So that is Jessica Boggs' top five list in television for 2018. I've got a top five as well. I'll start from the back end at number five. I'm going to go with, I think, and I'm probably in the minority here, the best show on Thursday nights when it comes to the comedy lineup on NBC, and that is Superstore. Sorry to The Good Place, which is an excellent show in its own right, and I know it's on your top five list. I think Superstore is just a little bit better, a little bit funnier to me. I like the humor. Maybe it's because I came from that type of background growing up. I saw a lot of individuals that, okay, yes, a lot of the characters on the show are accentuated, are a little bit out there, but they may not be so far off from individuals in everyday life as far as how they act and how they interact with customers, interact with themselves. So, yeah, it does get a little bit crazier than what real-life retail is all about, but not by much. And a lot of things that go on there are truly funny. And it's for me, someone who does not enjoy sitcoms very much, because I don't laugh at sitcoms, because there's so many TV sitcoms that I've seen over the years that I just don't laugh at. I don't find the humor enough in them because of the fact that they're so constrained by the you know what whatever's required on TV with FCC regulations and whatnot. Humor, to me, actually is better on a cinematic level, or maybe if I'm watching stand-up or whatnot, then you can really get me going as far as laughter is concerned. But one of the few shows in the history that I've ever watched that has made me chuckle is Superstore. And I think, overall, I think it's a a well-laid-out show. And I just like the fact that a lot of the characters do seem to get a type of, of depth to their characters that other shows don't get the chance to go ahead and duplicate. So that's one of the reasons why I enjoy Superstore so much. And I think, like I said, I'm in the minority here, but especially when I've seen critical lists and whatnot, but I do think Superstore is the best show on NBC when it comes to Thursday Night Comedy. And I'm so sad to see it being pushed a few months until March before we get new episodes. Number four for me, that's going to be Atlanta. I agree with you wholeheartedly on the concept of the show and how well it's executed by Donald Glover. It's just truly an outstanding and well-made show, just well-made series. He should just get a ton of credit for doing everything behind the scenes to make and craft what is probably one of FX's best shows ever on the network. I'm going to talk about another one here in a minute, but Definitely Atlanta is up there as far as one of the best shows on television. And without a doubt, it should be on anyone's top five list. And it's on mine at number four. Number three is Cobra Kai. Oh, you got to love Cobra Kai. Whether or not you are familiar with the Karate Kid movie from the past, it does enough to catch you up to speed with it. But the story of Johnny so many years later and his reaction to everything that's gone on and and 
what's taken place in his life and his down and out nature and what he tries to do to recover not only himself but his lost glory is just a truly well-made show it is probably to me the biggest surprise on video this year is cobra kai and i cannot say enough great things about it and it is worth youtube premium alone to get that series the first episode is free you got to check it out on youtube today it is cobra kai it is definitely a show you must see number two for me is the americans which i believe is the best drama ever on fx and one of the best dramas of the past 20 years it's definitely something that i enjoy very much and i think that a lot of people should have taken better notice of it while it was on the air it closed out its series on one of the best series notes ever. That last episode was just so surprising, but still just out there and, and really creative. Tell you what, everyone that's part of the Americans should be proud of what they did. It only garnered a couple Emmys over its lifespan of the series, which is a true big mistake by the Academy because the Americans, over the six-year run that it had, is truly one of the best shows ever on television. And number one for me, well, I wrote an article about it earlier this year, and I told you then why you have to binge it, because it is one of the best limited series that I've ever seen, and that is The Alienist. This limited series is truly a fantastic watch from beginning to end, especially episode six out there. Episode six to me was truly a high point in television I have not seen in quite some time. And The Alienist for me was... Probably a little bit ahead of the Americans at Cobra Kai, but not by much, sneaks out at number one. It is truly awesome television, which I don't find too often because we definitely see, just both you and I, over the years, a lot of bad television out there. There's not much good television anymore. It gets outweighed by all the junk that's out there, but definitely The Alienist tops them all for me in 2018. I did hear that there's going to be like a sequel to it. Yeah, there was a book that was made in events, I think, about a year or two after the events of The Alienist, and I think they're going to base it off of that book. I read a few months ago that they are because TNT was so happy for the success of The Alienist. It did earn Golden Globe nominations. It, the ratings were, yes, you and I both reported at the time, very good for it. So glad to see a sequel that will be in production at some point in time for The Alienist. But there's also a lot we need to talk about when it comes to the worst of television. And I just said there is a whole lot of bad television out there in 2018. I don't know, Jess. I think we can go to bottom 300 or 3,000 when it comes to shows on television that are really, truly bad television in the United States. But you know what? That being said, I'll let you go ahead with just three. So what are your bottom three in 2018 for television? My bottom three would be the Murphy Brown reboot, not the original, the reboot, and how it is executed. And obviously it's going to lead to most likely a cancellation for at this point in time from what your uh, statistics are saying. Is that correct? Exactly. It's bad ratings-wise, and it was a bad time to bring the show back, especially in a highly contested time in society. Well, I know a lot of other politically laden shows that do support one way or the other have gotten a lot of press and have actually benefited from it. But unfortunately, Murphy Brown wasn't the case. I think it just reached too old of an audience. I think the actors themselves maybe aged too much to be able to perform like their former selves. And the writing seemed to be uninspired at times. So I agree with you. That's a, that's a you know, in the weed of a lot of trash that's out there on television. That's uh, yeah, that's a pretty good pick there at number three. What's your number two on the, on the bottom list of television in 2018? I am going to say Roseanne because it's a little bit, because not the, not the original, but the reboot because of controversy with the lead star though. And I like the show. It's just, it's just so tainted though by controversy. But then again, we wouldn't have gotten the Connors if she hadn't have opened her mouth. That's true. That's true. In a new direction. Some call it a better direction. Be that as it may, depends on your opinion on the political spectrum. But Roseanne's ill-choiced and ill-timed words, unfortunately, cost her big time. The Connors moves on as a television show that does have a future. 
you know, it's not going to get the, the ratings that Roseanne did, but it doesn't need to. It just needs to do solid numbers from here on out. So I believe it is it is doing that at this point in time and it's going to be picked up for another year if it hasn't already. So Roseanne, the re- original reboot seen earlier this year with Roseanne Barr at number two, just, yeah, I just have to say, especially after the year that she's had, definitely it qualifies as a bottom television show. I got to hear from you, Jess. It's not Crazy Ex-Girlfriend on the bottom of your list, but I know there is one show that is terrible enough out there to just inspire just a disheartening from you when it comes to your thoughts on television. So I want to hear it. Your worst television show of 2018. It would have to be Bowl, to be honest, because Michael Weatherly is having some controversy. Well, it's not just about the controversy. Is it because of the content as well? Well, yeah, but it's kind of like, it's so boring. And it's hard to like sit through a whole entire episode of Bull. I hope my wife never hears this segment because she is a fan of the CBS dramas. I will tell you that. But I think you, between you and I, and also the many listeners that are out there that are probably going to, you know, inform my wife at some point in time. Although actually I've kind of told her myself, so... My bottom three is also very, uh, I guess, very inspired by a lot of what's going on out there as far as controversy is concerned. Number three in the worst of television in 2018 for me is The Walking Dead. And it's not because of the show is, is of a quality nature because, yeah, it's taken a downturn in quality in my eyes and storylines. I've said I've I've always said storylines for me are up and down when it comes to The Walking Dead. And that gets me in and out of watching the show. But the poor decisions that have been made recently when it comes to especially especially when it comes to the prior season of The Walking Dead, which finished in 2018, so many poor decisions. And then obviously the final one is Andrew Lincoln leaving the show, leaving you without the iconic star of the show itself and making it almost unbearable to watch at this point in time, even though Danai Gurria, Melissa McBride, there's so many other great actors on the show. But when it's just like you take that head out of the snake out of it when it comes to Rick Grimes' character, which is so integral to the comic book portion of it, and it just doesn't really make sense why you want to continue on with the program. You're just doing it for ratings. Even though the ratings have fallen so dramatically, it is still one of the top shows on cable. In fact, overall television, The Walking Dead is a number three for me, but more so for the decisions that have been made in killing off characters and characters leaving the show which to me has denigrated this overall storyline and really just not made it good for the overall future of The Walking Dead. I will still catch it. I still will talk to my good friend Daphne Matthew from The Walking Dead fan base about it, and I still will tune into it, but right now isn't a great time for The Walking Dead. I'm hopeful for better fortune for the show, but yeah, right now The Walking Dead for me is a number three. Number two for me is Bull. Yes, what a coincidence indeed. Bull is just, yeah, I mean, you can insert your bull whatever if you want to when you watch it. But yeah, the, the like you said, the concept is so boring as a courtroom drama with all the technology that's involved. So it's jury green, it's a jury red and all that stuff. But the storylines are really not, for me, not, not that great to follow. It's, I've sat down several times with my wife and we have tried to watch it and it is a slog that you have to try to go through. And despite the fact that Michael Weatherly also just poorly choice words, poorly choice actions, obviously everybody knows about the settlement that was made that became public, but be that as it may, the show itself is just really bottom of the barrel when it comes to a lot of what's going on in television. And bull is my number two. And for me as well, number one also happens to be on CBS. I don't know what's up with these CBS dramas, but I've never enjoyed NCIS. I've never enjoyed some of the others. CSI was an incredible show. Unfortunately, that is no longer on the air. They've had some good television programming, CBS has in the past, and a lot of other periodic and serial dramas and serial stuff, NCIS, throw out a, throw out a city, NCIS, whatever. They're all lame to me. But at number one, by far, that I think is just garbage 
a heaping, heaping pile of garbage. And I know I'm going to probably get roasted on this on as far as a lot of opinions otherwise. SEAL is, team. Is SEAL team. Navy SEALs. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's atrocious. Uh, I mean, I, te- I told you the story before that I was watching one episode with my wife. And I actually counted at seven minutes in that I already knew the entire storyline. I already knew the entire outcomes. And I already knew exactly who is going to be with who, who is going to save who, and all that. Everything I solved within the first seven minutes. And I didn't even want to. I just was there. It's just so obvious. And the writing is extremely uninspired. The camaraderie between the, the Navy SEALs themselves is just, it's not there for me. It's not there for me. After watching so many other movies that have done a much, much, much better job of portraying individuals such as that who serve our country so bravely, Navy SEALs just looks like a cash grab of higher proportions. And I, I just, I cannot stand it, Jess. It's just truly awful television at its highest. Yeah, well, we also had this like thing with like, we also call it like hashtag mega hit for those that are like in the lowest rated type shows. SEAL Team usually gets put on the list as mega hit. Well, it is a mega hit when it, when you consider it that way. But yeah, it is just some awful television. CBS doesn't care. It gets the ratings. And you know what? If it continues to do so, it's going to be on for more years to come, which my wife enjoys my wife enjoys the cbs period dramas more power to her i'm glad she finds a lot of enjoyment from it from that from the ncis shows and all the others but cbs from a quality standpoint for years has just gone on a downturn it's become very periodic it's become very uh cyclical you see the same thing over and over in each and every show that they have. You see the you see the, a lot of similarities. They have a formula that actually got them to the top of the ratings heap, and they've stuck to it. Right now, they're not number one, but they're very close to it. And this bad television, to me, you got to slog through it. But as long as it makes so many people happy, you know what? More power to you. But for me, yeah, definitely uh, Navy SEALs is the worst show on television. That definitely is a great list from you, both good and bad. Once again, it is Jessica Boggs from the TVRatingsGuide.com. You got to check out all of her work and all the great work of everyone else on the staff of the TVRG. There is no doubt about it. The TVRatingsGuide.com is the place to go for everything TV ratings and TV ratings news. Jessica, just cannot thank you enough for being part of the show. Once again, happy holidays to you and the family. Just Hope you have a tremendous holiday, a fantastic 2018, and also to the staff of the TVRG as well. Well, Happy holidays to you, too. Thank you so much. And as always, it's so great to have you a part of the pop culture cosmos. If you're tired of sifting through flea markets for rare and unique games, we can help. Retro City Games in Henderson, Nevada, only five minutes from the Las Vegas Strip, has all your favorite gaming staples, classics, and a wide selection of rare games with new stuff always appearing on our shelves. Come in and chat with Nicole or Doug about your love of games and watch as they help you complete your collection or find your childhood favorite. And don't forget, Retro City Games loves trade-ins. So if you have any Nintendo, Super Nintendo, Sega, Xbox, PlayStation, or even PC games, come in and visit Retro City Games today. Welcome to the new metropolis of gaming, Retro City Games. And we're back to close out the show. This is the Pop Culture Cosmos. want to thank Diana Tierney and Michelle Levis from the Wine, Women, and Words podcast. You got to check out their podcast today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and so many other podcast outlets. And also, as well, want to thank Jessica Box from the TVRatingsGuide.com for her thoughts on the best and worst in television in 2018. Before we head on out, my friend, there were two trailers that almost went under the radar in many ways for movies this week. We got to talk about them. MIB International, and of course, something that really touches your mind when it comes to it, and that is Hellboy. So I want to hear your thoughts, my friend, because we kind of differ on Hellboy. Are you glad to see it back, and are you glad to see someone else playing the role? I am ecstatic to see it back. And like, I, yeah, I agree with you. Um, David Harbour's wouldn't have been my number one choice for Hellboy. I enjoyed Ron Perlman in that part. Like I thought he was. Ron Perlman got me interested in in the Hellboy series and the Hellboy comic books. So that's to me, that's just 
Yeah, well, that's just from a, what I understand, they approached him about it, and he said he only wanted to work with do finish Guillermo's thing. If I read the news headlines correctly, or not well, you know they're so closely aligned together. Anything, you know, it seems like he does. For instance, uh, Pacific Rim, you know, he's in that. I mean, it's just the, it's just a great working relationship between each other. I, I could see why he didn't want to continue it, like the the Debt Burton relationship. Yeah, something like that. But like this, this Hellboy, you know, David Harbour. So I, I honestly, I don't think he's going to make a terrible Hellboy. I, I, it, you could tell it. He's not quite used to the the makeup just by the way his his mouth moves when he talks. No, I love how dark this one is though. It's not because Guillermo took a more like fantastic approach to things. You know, it's more fantasy oriented. Whereas this one kind of dives into the nitty gritty of of what makes Hellboy who he is. You know, he's this creature who's destined to destroy the Earth, but he rages against his own destiny and in the process of you know figuring out who he is he's fighting all these creatures he's you know going up against the forces of darkness and you know just watching the trailer like there's a lot of stuff from the comic books that i almost you know that they almost played out panel for panel like the part with the two giants from what i understand this one's about the blood queen and she's uh, yeah you know she's kind of the the doorway to the rest of the hellboy universe so if this is going to play out the way i think it is it they they might be setting something big up. And what's cool about this one is Mike Manola is producing it. So he's got a lot more say in what's going on, you know, and where, where the characters are going. And I'm pretty sure that he wrote the screenplay. So who knows Hellboy better than the person who created him? But, you know, you have all these characters and they kind of keep themselves, they keep themselves honest, you know, while they're fighting like these incredibly dark and demonic things. And it's, it's a cool dynamic to see light exist in such dark, you know, people with dark powers to to find them choosing the side of light over evil in a world that is pretty much made up of dark and evil things. The trailer itself looked good. I love the scenic atmosphere. I think the actual visual look was better than what Guillermo del Toro, what he could work with. I think obviously there were resources involved and whatnot, but I think from a visual standpoint, it looked better than what the previous Hellboy iterations were doing. Well, be that as it may, we're going to be able to see a lot more Hellboy coming in 2019. I know you'll be looking forward to it. And you know what? I hope I will be looking forward to it, too, as more trailers come out and we get to see more behind the scenes of what's going on in the world of Hellboy. And last but not least, let's talk about MIB International. Your thoughts on MIB International with Tessa Thompson and Chris Hemsworth, and also as well, Liam Neeson. So I want to hear your thoughts on this new trio going forward and battling aliens out there for the MIB. You know, say what you want about Men in Black. Like a lot of people like the first one, hate the second one, love the third one, whatever order you find that in. But they are fun movies to watch. They are you know, they, they, you don't go into them expecting a serious story. Men in Black kind of gave you that a little bit, but they're just fun to watch, you know? And it's this one reminds me of what made Men in Black one so fun. Like you have the outcast and you have the person who's, who, who's overly good at their job and you have the comedic chops going on in there. A lot of stuff with Chris Hemsworth. It looks like he's kind of exercising the, um, the thing that made Thor funny in Ragnarok, right? Like he has that. He has that ability to act on that on that. And, and let me ask you this, because it does have him and Tessa Thompson. Is it am I kind of like, I don't know, have my trepidations about it just because it reminds me too much of Thor Ragnarok? I think they had good chemistry together and it makes sense that they would be in that they would want them both for this movie. Will they be able to recapture the magic? who knows but it looks funny like it definitely looks funny and like i love the action parts that they showed with them you know making jokes and it's it's it doesn't look like they're taking them themselves too seriously and that's what makes me want to see this movie so bad that's our thoughts on mib international i like i said i'm looking forward to seeing that one and how it materializes well just worried about the playoff because they've already done such a great job of playing off each other tessa thompson and chris hemsworth in Thor Ragnarok, I'm just interested to see if this will pan out just as well. What are your thoughts about Hellboy and MIB International? Are you interested to see back the men in black? Share us your thoughts on both Hellboy and MIB, Pop Culture Cosmos at Yahoo.com, also as well, Pop Culture Cosmos, Humanica Media, and Game Source on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Well, my friend, it's been a great episode. 
This week on the PCC Multiverse, we're going to be talking about our video games of the year. So I'm looking forward to that. Any last thoughts on the way out? Honestly, guys, just have a great Christmas. It's been a fun year and you'll hear from us before the year's over. But have a great Christmas. And I hope you get some of the, the games and movies and stuff you wanted to. And if you, you like them, you got some stuff we discussed on the show, feel free to email us. We'd love to hear about it, hear your thoughts. And uh, we'll, we'd be happy to talk about it on the show. We will indeed. And again, a Merry Christmas to you and everyone out there as well. Safe and happy holidays to all. So for Josh Peterson, this is Gerald Glassford. It's another beautiful day in paradise right here in the pop culture cosmos. We thank you for listening. And here's hoping you have yourself a great day. gang are you looking for another podcast to listen to well you're in luck the nerdy laser is a podcast and we specialize in 90s nerd culture but we don't leave anything out if something is cool and nerdy we will talk about it so join myself richard yule and a variety of guests on the nerdy laser podcast available on itunes podbean and the eso network this has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping through Amazon.com or the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Tangent Bound Network. Let your voice be heard. Tangentboundnetwork.com. Thanks so much for downloading the Pop Culture Cosmos and stay tuned as more great podcasts are on the way. Thanks again for listening to us here at the Pop Culture Cosmos.